Good evening. I'm Thomas Canavan, the Executive Director of the National Law Enforcement Museum. Thanks to a collaboration with the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives and the Major City Chiefs Association, we're honored to bring you this important conversation about one of our essential rights guaranteed by law. The 14th Amendment to the United States Constitution was ratified in 1868, passed in the wake of the US Civil War, and says that no state can deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. As we commemorate Black History Month, we're taking some time this evening to consider what equal protection looks like across the country and how law enforcement can and does uphold equal protection for all citizens. Before we begin, I wanna thank our generous sponsor, Target, who has been an active supporter and longtime partner of the National Law Enforcement Museum. Without their support, today's program would not be possible. To get us started, I'd like to introduce some opening remarks, first from Tony Heredia. Tony is the Senior Vice President and Chief Ethics and Compliance Officer for Target. His own professional career began in law enforcement and we're glad to hear a few words from him this evening. Tony, thank you for joining us. You're welcome, Thomas, and thank you very much for having me this evening. It is really special to be here with the group tonight. I think this is a critically important topic at a really important time for our country. And it's made even more special by the fact that Target has been proud to be a partner with the museum and the Memorial Fund since the very beginning, uh, since the time the museum was, was concepted as an idea makes it even more meaningful for us tonight. It's convening moments like this that are a really important step to continuing dialogue and building relationships within and across communities. And I wanna recognize the amazing leaders on today's panel and all the work that they do along with their respective departments and agencies. It's really seasoned and broad-minded leaders like those we will all hear from this evening that are critically important voices in this national conversation around community-centric public safety. And lastly, I'd like to acknowledge the timeliness of this topic. As you already mentioned, Thomas, the 14th Amendment was ratified more than 150 years ago. However, its key tenets, specifically equal protection under the law, are among the most fundamental rights we enjoy as Americans. And the oath that law enforcement officers take across the country is often premised by a duty to uphold the Constitution of the United States before all else, something most people don't think about on a day-to-day -day basis. So we are all honored to support an event that helps bring this important topic into the national conversation. And now I am pleased to introduce some remarks by Kristen Clark, Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the Department of Justice. Enjoy, everybody. I'm Kristen Clark. Assistant Attorney General for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Justice. I'm so honored to be able to be a part of this program. Thank you to the National Law Enforcement Memorial Museum, as well as the Major Cities Chiefs Association and the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives for hosting this important event. I also want to recognize Chief Jerry Williams of Major City Chiefs, Captain Frederick Thomas, President of Noble, and Thomas Canavan, Executive Director of the Museum. And last but not least, I wanna acknowledge Steve Rosenbaum, Chief of the Special Litigation Section in the Civil Rights Division, who'll be joining us later in the program. I've had the privilege of working with law enforcement officers throughout my entire career, and it is not lost on me the critical role that law enforcement plays in our society. It is no surprise to this group to hear that this is a challenging time to be in law enforcement. And despite these challenges, law enforcement officers around the country go to work every day, dedicated to their commitment to protect the most vulnerable people in our communities. This is a promise to uphold our laws fairly and to defend people without regard to race or other protected characteristics, as the 14th Amendment and a host of civil rights laws require. This is a commitment shared by the Civil Rights Division, where 
we recognize that our success at ensuring public safety and upholding the federal civil rights of people living in this country is often tied to our partnership with state and local law enforcement. These opportunities for partnership often arise in three areas that are core priorities for the Civil Rights Division, and especially relevant as the esteemed panelists discuss issues related to law enforcement's commitment to providing equal protection under the law for all citizens. First, protecting the rule of law and increasing public trust demands that those who enforce our laws also abide by them. Every single day, dedicated law enforcement officers do just that when they put themselves in harm's way to safeguard our communities. There are more than 18,000 law enforcement agencies across the country, and the majority of those who police our communities do so with professionalism, respect, bravery, and integrity. But we also know that when law enforcement agencies engage in unconstitutional policing, it can severely undermine both community trust and public safety. One of the highest priorities of the Civil Rights Division is to ensure that every person in this country benefits from policing that is lawful, effective, transparent, and free from discrimination. All communities are safer when people trust that the justice system is transparent and constitutionally sound. And we at the department believe that one of the most effective and important ways we can build that trust is by investigating patterns or practices of misconduct by law enforcement agencies and addressing these systemic problems where we find them through cooperation and negotiated reforms and resolutions. During uh, our event today, Steve Rosenbaum will highlight our work in this area. We remain eager to hear from you all about your experiences and suggestions for collaborative reform as we undertake this critically important work across the country. Second, we must continue to work together to address hate crimes and hate incidents. Indeed, the Civil Rights Division does much of our work in this area in collaboration with state and local law enforcement officers. The FBI's 2020 hate crimes uh, statistics confirm that hate crimes rose in 2020 to their highest levels in more than a decade. And the majority of these crimes, over 60%, were motivated by race and ethnicity. And of those, more than a third targeted African Americans. One example includes the tragic February 2020 murder of Ahmaud Arbery. Three men responsible for his killing were found guilty of federal hate crimes charges just earlier this week. We also saw a sharp rise in reported attacks on people of Asian descent this year, including multiple terrible attacks on seniors and women. We have to look no further than the deeply disturbing hostage situation that took place in Colleyville, Texas in January to appreciate the issues that Jewish and other faith communities continue to face. The Justice Department is committed to helping law enforcement identify and report hate crimes and respond to hate incidents. Last year, Attorney General Merrick Garland issued a directive requiring the Justice Department to take several steps to combat unlawful acts of hate by improving incident reporting, promoting training, facilitating coordination at the federal, state, and local levels, and prioritizing community outreach. I encourage you to visit justice.gov backslash hate crimes for additional information on grants, trainings, and other resources that might be available. Finally, the Civil Rights Division also partners with law enforcement to assist officers in effectively interacting with our increasingly language diverse communities. Language access in the policing context is critical to ensuring that domestic violence victims, hate crimes victims, 
and other crime victims are able to access the full range of services provided by law enforcement. When public entities communicate only in the English language, we miss the opportunity to receive complaints, tips, or otherwise engage with the nearly 25.6 million limited English proficient individuals living in the United States. To assist federal agencies as well as state and local agencies, the Civil Rights Division creates tools that help these entities maintain a multilingual presence. And we encourage you to visit lep.gov for a listing of resources. Whether it's promoting public trust through constitutional policing or combating hate crimes or dismantling language barriers and communications with the public, the Civil Rights Division stands ready to partner with law enforcement as we work collectively to fulfill the promise to promote public safety and ensure equal justice under law for all. Thank you and enjoy the rest of the program. Many thanks to Assistant Attorney General Clark and to Tony Heredia for their thoughts. And now to introduce our moderator and keynote speaker for this evening, Chief Daniel Hahn. Chief Hahn recently retired from a distinguished career of over 34 years in law enforcement, most recently serving as the first African-American Chief of Police for the city of Sacramento, California. He began his career in law enforcement in 1987 when he was hired as a community service officer in Sacramento. In 2011, he was sworn in as Roseville's 15th chief of police and served for over six years before returning to his hometown as the 45th chief of police for the Sacramento Police Department. He currently serves as an adjunct professor at California State University, Sacramento, and teaches a history and bias course that he developed through his years of research. Chief Han, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, Thomas. It's my pleasure to be here. So uh, I would like to thank the National Law Enforcement Memorial and Museum, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, and the Major City Chiefs Association for partnering to bring this important conversation forward in hopes of a better tomorrow for all people. I would also like to thank Target for sponsoring this event and continuing to work with law enforcement around our country to support our communities. I actually have personally seen their support of our communities here in Sacramento. I believe today is another example of different people and different organizations coming together to make our country better tomorrow for everyone because division has never been the way forward. I would also like to thank all of those who have joined us today on this Zoom call for this important conversation because this is critical for all people to be involved and will take all of us to achieve the full destiny of the 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment of our Constitution marked an important legal milestone for the equality of all people in our country. But as history and the current day shows us, legal achievements on paper are not enough. They must be full partners with changes in hearts and minds in order to achieve the full meaning of these historic legal achievements, such as the 14th Amendment. We must address the root causes of why we needed this in the first place. For example, one of the reasons the 14th Amendment was adopted in July of 1868 was to bolster or strengthen the purpose of the 13th Amendment that was adopted a few years earlier in 1865. As we all know, the 13th Amendment came after the Civil War and stated that slavery nor involuntary servitude shall exist in the United States, except, except as punishment for a crime coupled with a conviction. Because we didn't fully address the roots of what allowed the institution of slavery, a brutal, racist, exploitative system, we simply wrote a law forbidding slavery 
instead of also addressing the hearts and minds of what got us there in the first place, a systemic process in which we, the United States, made the color of skin a badge of degradation. Because we only address slavery with legal words of the 13th Amendment, we soon, during the Reconstruction period, found other ways to continue the institution of slavery. We called it convict leasing, often called slavery by another name. Convict leasing was supported by black codes, which were modeled after the previous slave codes, and not just in the South, but throughout our country. The system continued to exploit the black community in brutal ways on plantations, coal mines, and factories throughout our country. Over 70% of Alabama's annual state revenue came from convict leasing during this time. Due to their not being equal protections, in some jurisdictions, due to convict leasing and black codes, the percentage of African Americans in the prison population increased over 30% within 12 years, all because hearts and minds didn't view African Americans as equal. Even though the 14th Amendment was adopted in 1868, over 90 years later, William Byron Rumford had to pass the Rumford Fair Housing Act in California to ensure property owners could not refuse to sell or rent to someone solely because they were black or what we called at the time colored. And because we didn't address the hearts and minds, the California Real Estate Association put forward Proposition 14 a year later to ensure that landlords could discriminate solely based on the color of one's skin. In 1964, it passed with over 65% of the voters in California agreeing, we should be able to treat people differently solely because of their race. But armed with the equal protection legal requirement of the 14th Amendment, Nathaniel Colley, Sacramento's first African-American attorney, argued against Prop 14 in the California Supreme Court. And the courts agreed it violated our 14th Amendment and that the newly passed Proposition 14 was unconstitutional. In 1954, Thurgood Marshall argued that school segregation violated the 14th Amendment and the US Supreme Court unanimously agreed ruling segregation in schools was unconstitutional. A much different conclusion than the same US Supreme Court ruled in Plessy versus Ferguson in 1896 when they stated, the 14th Amendment does not eliminate all social or other distinctions based on color. See, we never address the hearts and minds that believe that color of your skin made you less than. Even with the Supreme Court's decision in Brown versus the Board of Education, it took four years before the Little Rock Nine attempted to integrate Little Rock Central High School, but they were met with angry mobs that didn't want their children to attend school with black students. It wasn't until President Eisenhower federalized the National Guard that they were able to integrate their school. Six years later, young six-year-old Ruby Bridges integrated William Franz Elementary School in New Orleans with the daily protection of the U.S. Marshal's Office. She received threats, her family received threats, and all but one teacher, Miss Barbara Henry, refused to teach little Ruby Bridges, hearts and minds. Nine years later, in 1963, George Wallace, the governor of Alabama, took, uh, stood in the schoolhouse doors of the University of Alabama, refusing to let the first African-American students into the university. Earlier that same year, in his inaugural address, George Wallace said, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. It wasn't until President Kennedy intervened that the University of Alabama was fully integrated, even though the highest court in our country previously ruled school segregation unconstitutional. In 1960, four freshmen at North Carolina A&T State University, a historically black college in Greensboro, North Carolina, stepped up against inequality when they sat at a segregated lunch counter. On that day, the Greensboro Four started a movement and were joined by thousands of others and changed our country together. 
Over 100 years after the 14th Amendment was ratified, we continue to see this devastating impacts of redlining, housing discrimination, inequality in education, and disparities that run through many facets of our country, including law enforcement, education, government, and much more. Today, we continue to hear claims of inequality and in things such as the NFL coaching ranks. Just in the last couple of weeks, Howard University, a historically black college in Washington, DC, their women's lacrosse team faced racist taunts from fans when they traveled to play another university. It was reported that the fans yelled, you are not welcome here. And if it ain't white, it ain't right. We continue to see widely different investments depending on which neighborhood you live in. It is critical we learn how we got here. It is imperative we know our history and the root causes of the inequality that often manifests itself in lost dreams and potential, lost lives and unrest in cities across our country. Because in order to address equal protection for all, we must know what caused the lack of protection in the first place. Knowing our history is to know that law enforcement has played a large role in the inequalities in our country, often serving as enforcers of what our lawmakers and our society values. Law enforcement often enforced unequal rules, laws, and societal norms, such as black codes. But these rules, laws, and societal norms were enacted by lawmakers and supported by our society at large. As you've heard a few minutes ago, law enforcement has played a crucial role in ensuring equal protections for all, such as ensuring young six-year-old Ruby Bridges was not harmed by simply trying to get a good education. They are the brave men and women who we have high expectations for and rely on the guard on, on them to guard the values of our constitution and the American dream every day. We need them now as much as ever to ensure all people have equal protection. But this cannot solely rest on the shoulders of law enforcement because it isn't solely due to law enforcement that we got here. We must all ensure equal protection for all. We must all ensure we reach the full intent of the 14th Amendment of our United States Constitution. And I believe our Congresswoman is uh, now on the call, so I'll turn it back over to Thomas um, to introduce the Congresswoman. Thank you so much, Chief Han. Uh, really appreciate um, that address. And we are um, so grateful to have Representative Jackson Lee here with us tonight. Um, the Congresswoman uh, is traveling and is, is in Europe currently. Um, and so we know it's very late. Um, we, uh, as always, have appreciated your support of the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund. And again, we're so honored to have you here with us tonight. So with that said, Congresswoman, I turn it over to you. Thank you so very much for having me. And thank you again for the uh, purpose and values of this great organization, the National Law Enforcement Memorial Fund. Uh, thank you, Chief, for laying out a very eloquent and detailed explanation of a very important constitutional right that tracked three important pro democracy, pro-freedom amendments passed in the midst of ending the illegal holding of human beings in bondage. The 13th Amendment that created the opportunity to free the slaves, uh, leaving uh, a element of incarceration and as you indicated, uh, using prison labor, uh, but also the 14th Amendment that provided for equal justice under the law and due process and then the 15th Amendment, which of course was the unfettered right to vote. I hold in my hands this constitution. I am now in the midst of the uh, illegal and violent war uh, that is attacking the innocent dem democracy loving people of Ukraine. I only use that uh, to emphasize the importance of a democracy. We live in a democracy. We are a democratic republic. The people of Ukraine are fighting for democracy to be preserved and for their sovereignty to be preserved. But lawlessness can be created in many different ways. 
lawlessness in this instance is a terrorist tyrannical leader by the name of Putin who has ignored all international uh, laws and is now attacked again an innocent sovereign nation and on the way to attacking further nations in the region. We in the United States have an outstanding opportunity in the oldest democracy to one, live under a constitution that provides the even handedness, the respect for law and order, the respect for the order of things, and yes, the respect for due process, and of course, the idea of equal justice under the law. And that is not incompatible with the many outstanding law enforcement officers across America. I want you to know that as the chair of the Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security Committee, I know full well that the American people want to be protected uh, by those who wear the badge. They want to be respected as they respect. And they also realize that we're a safer and more constitutional nation when the laws of the land are abided by. And so the very idea of the understanding of the 14th Amendment in the training of law enforcement officers provides us an enhanced opportunity for community cooperation. I'd like to think of it as community police relationships because that is what I'd like to promote in my congressional committee. We talk about the improving of relationships. And so when I introduced the initial George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which was the Law Enforcement Trust and Integrity Act, it was an idea of bringing together all of the skills needed for the finest police departments in the world. It was to take the 18,000 police departments and provide them with the resources for training, understanding de-escalation, understanding the duty to care, understanding the uh, ability uh, to ensure uh, that each encounter traffic stops that are so deadly, domestic uh, calls, that we find a way that the officer can go home safely to his or her family, and that we have the kind of training that eliminates bias and appreciates the different cultural norms, racial background, and religious backgrounds of this wonderfully diverse America. That is what I believe we can all do together. It is not difficult for us to be able to find the training that is necessary. Take, for example, the Violence Against Women Act that I wrote. I did not write it simply to try to find housing for abused women and others. We included in there over $300 million for policing uh, improvement as it relates to rape cases, DNA, prosecution, because we know that the people who are victims of domestic abuse and rape and assault, sexual assault, they want justice. And the first line of offense is that officer who comes to the scene. So we have an ability, again, to take this constitution in the 14th Amendment and the vision that Abraham Lincoln had before his assassination in freeing the slaves to make America a more perfect union. That is the beginning of the words of the Constitution, to make America in order to create a more perfect union. The Declaration of Independence says we all are created equal with certain inalienable rights of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Communities are safer when each citizen and law enforcement alike have that as an ideal for what they would like. Have you seen little children look at a uniform? In most instances, they look with admiring eyes and they look at someone who is a protector. So this program this evening, focusing on the 14th Amendment should also be focused on the success that we can have as we improve police community relationships. Let me conclude my remarks by taking note of some of the ways that the Houston Police Department has exhibited that. Yes, they do funny things. They have Halloween parties out in inner city neighborhoods. They dress up like Santa Claus and give out bikes during the Christmas holiday. They come to and participate in civic club meetings where citizens are just uh, there to hear uh, how their quality of life can be improved. And the officers are there taking notes and saying, we'll look into this. That may not even be their area, but since they're governmental, they'll take it back to the appropriate governmental entity in the county or city. Yes, of course, they are in churches and 
They go to banquets honoring pastors. They're seen, they're heard, they're believed. And I think these are examples of the right kind of attitude. We will soon be doing a gun buyback with the Houston Police Department, the city of Houston, and the 18th Congressional District in our city. We're doing it together and hoping that the community will respond as they are incensed by the gun violence that is plaguing America. So I believe that there are pathways that we can utilize the 14th Amendment where we see each other in equal eyes, but we also find ways to improve policing in our community. And one thing that we say to the community, we have a duty to care, but we do care. And we have a duty to protect you, but we do it in a way that complies with the Constitution and the 14th Amendment. I thank you so very much for giving me the opportunity in the midst of the battles that are based upon the reckless disregard of international law by Putin, a terrorist. I'm grateful to be talking to you this evening about how we in America abide by laws, appreciate the Constitution, and love our democracy. We truly are a place together, each of us, law enforcement and community, where we come together to create a more perfect union. God bless all of you, and God bless the United States of America. Thank you so much, and we very much appreciate and thank you for being here with us tonight. Uh, <clears throat> on behalf of me and, and our organization, we are overjoyed uh, to have you and all of our panelists here with us tonight participating in this discussion. So thank you again, Representative Jackson Lee, and um, all the best with you and your team uh, in Europe and Lithuania at this time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank At this time, we'll bring back on uh, Chief Han to get our discussion started. Thank you, everybody, for being here with us. Thank you, Thomas. I, too, would like to thank the Congresswoman for being on here. She's doing some important work right now, and she still found the time uh, for uh, this event today. So at this time, it's my honor to introduce our distinguished panel of law enforcement leaders to delve more into the 14th Amendment and our promise to protect. So with us today, uh, we have Commissioner Danielle Outlaw of the Philadelphia Police Department. She leads the nation's fourth largest police department with more than 6,500 sworn officers and 800 civilians. She is also the first African-American woman to lead the Philadelphia Police Department. She has also presented on various topics, including race and policing, women in law enforcement, de-escalation and investigation of use of force, building community relationships after controversy, and video recording and policing and early intervention systems. Commissioner Outlaw began her law enforcement career, shout out to Oakland, California, where she spent 20 years in service with the Oakland Police Department. Prior to taking the helm at Philadelphia, she was also the chief of police in Portland, Oregon's Bureau of Police. Commissioner Outlaw is a member of the International Associations of Chiefs of Police, Human and Civil Rights Committee, the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement uh, Executives, and is Eastern Region Representative member of the Major City Chiefs Association. Next, I'd like to introduce Captain Frederick Thomas. Serves, he serves as commander of the Scotlandsville substation in East Baton Rouge Paris Sheriff's Office where he has served for over 22 years. Captain Thomas is also a US military combat veteran who retired after 26 years of service with the Louisiana Army National Guard. In serving his country in support of our Operation Iraqi Freedom, Captain Thomas earned the Combat Action Badge. On August 4th, 2021, Captain Thomas was sworn in as the 44th president of the National Organization of black law enforcement executives. He is also an active member of the International Association of Chiefs of Police and the Police Executive Research Forum. And the last member of our distinguished panel today is Stephen Rosenbaum. Mr. Stephen Rosenbaum is the chief of the Special Litigation Section in the Civil Rights Division of the Department of Justice. During his 43-year career in, civil, in the Civil Rights Division, Steve was uh, has served as the chief of the voting section and the chief of the housing and civil enforcement section. In 2012, President Obama conferred the rank of distinguished executive 
in the senior executive service for sustained extraordinary accomplishment in the management of programs and for leadership exemplifying the highest standards of service to the public. Welcome panel. So I will start with uh, Mr. Rosenbaum. So first question for you, let's take a step back for a moment. The 14th Amendment does not exist in a vacuum. So can you give us some background on how the 14th Amendment informs the work of law enforcement? Thank you, Chief Ryan. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and thank the uh, Museum and the Memorial Fund for hosting this event. Um, so as you noted, and as um, Assistant Attorney General Clark noted, the 14th Amendment was passed after the Civil War in the 1800s. Um, and with the intent of protect, preventing um, intentional discrimination against African Americans through the Equal Protection Clause. Of course, the Equal Protection Clause is broader than that uh, and protects other groups of people from uh, unlawful differential treatment. Um, but one of the things that's interesting, I think today when we think about how the Constitution applies to policing, we think about things like the Fourth Amendment, um, which prohibits unreasonable searches and seizures and unreasonable force, and the Fifth Amendment that prohibits the, protects the privilege against self-incrimination, the Sixth Amendment that deals with um, rights during criminal prosecutions, and the Eighth Amendment that protects against cruel and unusual punishment. Um, none of these constitutional amendments were considered to apply to state and local governments, and so state and local police forces. Um, for over 90 years after the 14th Amendment was, was uh, enacted, um, and, the, and there's a different clause um, in, the, in the 14th Amendment that says that a state shall not um, deny a person liberty without due process of law. And through the word liberty and due process of law, in the 1960s, Congress, uh, the Supreme Court uh, began to apply the constitutional protections in the Bill of Rights to state and local law enforcement. And that was through um, the 14th Amendment. So, in addition um, to all that the amendment has done to address racial discrimination and other forms of discrimination, it is the constitutional vehicle for applying um, the Bill of Rights to state and local police departments. Excuse me, technical difficulties, couldn't get my mouse to work. Um, before we go to the next question for the commissioner, I'd like to also remind people that um, we will try to get to questions at the end of this, if time permits, and you can submit questions through the Q&A button at the bottom right of your screen. Um, so hopefully we will be able to get to several of those questions. So just click on there and somebody will receive them. So uh, Commissioner Outlaw, as an African-American woman serving as police chief, one of very few in our country, how would you describe your perspective on the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment? Uh, yeah, thank you, Chief, for that question. And I just want to say uh, thank you for having me here this evening. It's an honor to be a part of such an amazing uh, panel of speakers, and it's really I think a great opportunity for us to have a conversation that um, we don't typically have enough. Um, so with that said, I mean, I think it goes without saying that I was born this way. You know, I've been an African American female now, a grown woman um, for my entire existence. And I happen to choose the profession of law enforcement. The reason why that's important is because I think nowadays, and I, I, I would say most recent in recent years, I often get asked a lot of questions um, with the assumption that I have to choose either being an African-American woman or versus choosing having the perspective of being law enforcement. And I've been both my entire adult, you know, within my entire uh, career. Um, with all of that said, because this is the case, I have a unique perspective. I have lived experience as a black woman, as a black female in this country, as a mother, of two sons that are 23 and almost 21, um, growing up with experiences, uh, not necessarily having favorable interactions with the police as a young child uh, and having to have 
positive interactions injected into my life so that I now trust these and now I even aspire to become, you know, as a young as a young girl, I never in a million years thought that I would grow up to be a police chief and now the police commissioner uh, in the city of Philadelphia. But with all of that said, because I bring the unique perspective that I bring, my perspective uh, and my openness and my willingness to understand and to learn not only helps me inform policy, um, but really allows me to step in as a leader and slow the train down when, when need be. And here's what I mean by that. I think you mentioned Chief Han in, in your remarks, how historically police have been brought in to enforce um, inequitable laws. And because we're enforcers, we by proxy are now perpetuating the very, uh, you know, fill in the blank, all of the isms that we're trying to fight against. And it's my role as a gatekeeper to ensure that we're not only upholding the laws fairly and upholding the constitution, but to, to say, hey, time out, time out. When I see with my lived experience that this will potentially have um, you know, an unintended consequence or a disparate impact uh, that's completely counter to what's trying to be accomplished in the first place. So I say all of this to say uh, that obviously I have a, a unique position and I'm glad that I have a seat at the table uh, to be able to say something and advocate on behalf of underrepresented populations but also at the same time, um, you know, as a human being, I have also had to, like many of us, have had to deal with that cognitive dissonance when we see um, that the laws weren't working in our favor, or when our colleagues across the country, with, uh, you know, amongst these 18,000 police departments in the country, aren't enforcing the laws in the same ways that some of the other departments have been. So I will tell you, as a human being, it, it's, it's been a bit of a challenge, but it continues to inspire and motivate me to make sure that we're doing the right thing, uh, you know, heading the fourth largest police department in the country. Thank you very much, Commissioner. So Captain Thomas, um, how would you, uh, how do you feel law enforcement leaders like yourself can ensure our country lives up to the words written in the 14th Amendment? Thank you, Chief. And first, I'd like to bring you greeting from the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives and through our many over 4,000 members throughout the nation. And I'd like to thank you again for your opening because I started reaching out. I read the 14th Amendment and it brought back some memory. I'm growing up in the South my whole life. I've been in the deep South. So a lot of the things that come out of the 14th Amendment actually started with the South. Started with the Emancipation Proclamation. That, which was read September 12th, 1862. Then now we got a national holiday celebrating it now, a Juneteenth, which people in Texas didn't really receive this information in 1865. So it's a lot to go with this. I'm saying I've taken it kind of hard right now because I'm dealing with this and I just love it because this conversation should have been going on. The conversation should be going on every day in every community throughout this nation. And that'll stop a lot of this division of what's going on now. To bring the civil right, like the civil right bill took 102 years before it actually brought before Congress. And the civil rights, and you know a lot of the civil unrest, Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi, a lot of this thing was going on. And it was hard for, especially being a black male. For black males, my grandfather, my great grandfather who lived through this. But the 14th Amendment, if we continue with the communication, I'm saying a lot of stuff stopped with communication. It just stopped and a civil unrest in the community started going on. You have not riots in 1965 in Watts, California. And the police have a big part in that. I'm saying first thing, there wasn't that no many, many colored officers back then. Men of color throughout the nation with law enforcement. So this 14th Amendment even gave us a right for blacks to start being a part of the law enforcement, be a part of the solution. And we were needed at that time. We were needed and we still need it now. We still having problems right now communicating the transparency in the law enforcement. But we can stop it today with the communication here. We start getting off this, uh, get off this panel. We need to just start communicating this to everybody. And through my members of Noble, I encourage all my chapters throughout the nation every time I always say, we need to start getting more involved with the local and the federal government. We need to meet with these people. We need to talk to them 
and make sure we have a seat at the table. We have a seat at the table now, not many. I tell people all the time, I always go back to Shirley Chisholm, a congressman from New York. If you don't have a seat at the table, bring you a chair. You gotta bring your own chair, people, because we need to work this thing out. The 14th Amendment, it could go on. We can talk about this all day, but how are we getting treated fairly now? I think we're making progress. We're knocking on the door, but the door's still not opening throughout the nation. It's not, you see now, you're keeping up with the news now. We have the, uh, we got the census number back. We're trying to do redistricting here in Louisiana right now and throughout the nation now. And now they're trying to push back on that. We can't get fair representation in the legislature now because they sending all, they sending it back to the local state government to make the ruling on it. And it's leaving the black communities out. They leaving us out. Also, the Voting Act right is coming back up. Now things that we fought for so long for to be equal, is coming back to affect the communities of color now. And it's getting hard for us as law enforcement to talk to the community guy because they're making it harder on us because they feel they don't have no hope. We got to bring hope back to the communities, especially the African-American community because it's gone. The same thing that affected us in the 1960s is coming back, housing, Housing coming back. People came to ask somebody discriminate the other day on in my community for fair housing. So the same fight. So then law enforcement got to get involved. Law enforcement is called out. Then we get into a situation that could have been avoided because we this thing was this law was written in 1862. 1862. And we still fighting some of the same fights. But to make it better. Nobody got a program of law in your community. We're trying to build trust. So we're having a conversation to stop a confrontation. Because you cut your television on every 15 or 20 minutes, there's something on the news that relates to law enforcement just on simple equal right things. Simple things that law enforcement never, never should have been called or got involved. Anyway, we should have never got involved in that. But now we're there. We got to make sure we're protecting the rights of all people, not just community of colors. All people got to be treated fairly. And we got to just be honest. A lot of people don't like to talk about the situation. But that's what I like to do. I like to talk about the situation. I like to get my organization involved so we can have these talks throughout the nation. Every day we need to be talking. Chief, I'd like to reach out to you in California. I'm glad to see uh, Representative Lee on the call. Commissioner uh, Altlow, she's doing a great job in Philadelphia. But we can only, only get better together if we talk together. And I always have a saying. Safer, stronger, and better together. We only safer and stronger, better together if we all work together. And it starts in DC. It starts at your state legislation. And we need to be involved. We shouldn't have to wait till February of Black History Month to start discussing these things. We need to have the same conversation in March, April, May, June, July, the whole year. We shouldn't be focusing on one month. Black history, it's a yearly, a yearly topic, not just one topic, it's a yearly topic. And Chief, I can go on and on, <laughs> kind of get into my feelings right now, but we gotta work together, we gotta work together. And the only reason I'm in law enforcement because I got a commitment to service. I'm, a, I'm committed to service. Did 26 years in the military because I got, I believe in this country. I believe in the constitution. And to, we go and get into everybody, we got to get involved. We got to get involved. It start with the littlest kid. I tell people all the time, we lose a kid in the third grade, we done lost that kid forever. Then they go back to uh, the prison system, which you mentioned in your opening statement. We got to save the communities. So you got Target on here, he's one of the sponsors, uh, the Target guy who's on the call. We need the people, we need big businesses to get involved. Everybody need to be involved to fight this fight. Because the 14th Amendment don't mean anything to the people in some of these communities out here. I'm just gonna be honest with you. It doesn't mean anything because a lot of guys don't know what it is. A lot of people do not know what the 14th Amendment is. But we can enforce it as it's rolled back in the 1800s. We still going on 200 years and we feel like we're falling back to where we started. So I'm gonna end on that note, Chief. And uh, thank you, sir, for allowing me to be on this call. And thank the members of Noble who's actually here. Thank you. Thank you, Captain Thomas. and. Uh... Let, let me promise you, 
if you call, I will definitely answer the phone. Thank you, sir. I will call. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to go back to Mr. Rosenbaum uh, real quick with uh, another question. What authority does the U.S. Department of Justice have to enforce the 14th Amendment? So um, Congress passed a law in 1994. It was uh, part of the Violent Crime Control and Law Enforcement Act, the statute that created the COPS program and the hiring of 100,000 police officers um, and has uh, many other provisions that's very controversial, have become controversial over time. But there are two sentences in a very th thick law that give the Department of Justice authority to investigate and file litigation to address a pattern of practice of conduct by law enforcement officers that violates the federal constitution or federal law. Um, and if we conclude there's a problem, we have authority to seek equitable relief, which is re police reform, to eliminate the pattern of practice um, that we identified. So it is through that statute that we can enforce the 14th Amendment um, and the other constitutional amendments that uh, uh, affect uh, policing. We can also enforce federal statutes um, and um, some of th those statutes, some of those statutes follow the receipt of federal financial assistance um, and a commitment that there not be discrimination. Um, one, as, as, it as it relates to race discrimination, one of the things that's significant about the enforcement of the statutes is that the Supreme Court has held the 14th Amendment prohibits intentional racial discrimination. Um, the federal law that travels with the receipt of federal funds um, prohibits not only intentional discrimination, uh, but treatment um, that has a disparate impact and is not justified. Um, so that's the principal vehicle that the Department of Justice uses um, to look at uh, police departments to see whether there are systemic problems um, that violate the Constitution or federal law. Thank you. And I, I think uh, that last part you said is very important. Voting as I know you've worked uh, in the topic of voting in your career, that's what really changed a lot in voting when it was not necessarily intentional, but resulted in a disparate impact, which is what changed a lot about voting in our country. So thank you. Commissioner Outlaw, I'd like to go back to you. Um, what are the greatest obstacles that you feel that we face today in preserving the equal protection under law? I, I think, Chief, I will take uh, your words, winning hearts and minds. Hearts and minds, um, you know, we're talking about perspective, we're talking about um, diversity, whether diversity exists, we're talking about shared understandings, we're talking about the need for empathy and compassion. We're dealing with human beings, human nature, and naturally, because we are all human beings, we all carry some form of bias. And so depending on, again, lived experiences, um, you know, some folks may not believe that there's a need to even have these conversations, one, or that the 14th Amendment um, is important or something that we need to pay attention to in law enforcement, for example. I, you know, I'm going to be very frank with you uh, to the captain's point. We talk about these topics very freely and regularly um, in February. But when Black History Month is over, and those of us who have been fighting this fight for a very long time continue to bring up the need for equity and uh, being impartial and addressing bias and all these things, then sometimes we go down the rabbit hole of saying, well, this is race baiting or, you know, having bringing in, in narrative that makes it seem like what we're talking about today in February isn't as appropriate to talk about in March. And so because of this, because people bring different understandings and, and uh, different experiences, training, education, awareness constantly is key and important. And the use of data to inform people to say, look, this is what the numbers tell us. We can all have the best intentions, but if the impact isn't what, if we're, we're not having the impact that we're trying to have or the intended outcomes that we're trying to have, all of this is a moot point. So I'm saying all of that to say, um, you know, we, we have to be ready to inform on a regular basis. We have to be open to meeting people where they are, recognizing it's gonna be some difficult conversations that may be had, but, but crucial. 
And they have to happen outside of just one month. And in order to do that, we have to normalize having these conversations and say, look, these conversations aren't just for academic institutions to have. We have to understand our role in law enforcement um, and how we, again, can carry out some of the systemic inequities. As police departments, do we have systems of accountability in place? Are we doing our own self-introspection, doing our own self-auditing to determine whether or not there's patterns or practice? Um, you know, violations, or do we have to have an outside set of eyes come in to tell us? And are we even open to that? So I think that the basic challenges that we're talking about is just human nature and whether or not, again, depending on where we are, whether or not there's a willingness to have these conversations and then to address any of the inequities that make themselves um, identified when we do these audits. Thank you. Um, Captain Thomas, I want to allow you, if you had anything to add to that as a captain and a president of a very important organization in Noble and uh, as a military a veteran, uh, do, you, uh, do you see any obstacles you, uh, across our country to prevent us fully offering or receiving equal protection? I think you're on mute. Can you hear me, sir? There you go. Okay, I'll stand. The commissioner said, she said it best. I'm saying it start with training. It start with the training of trust. And I tell people all the time, it starts with the basic leader. The leaders we have in place that the different nations throughout the nation. A lot of these things that goes on throughout the nation, it could have been avoided. If that right supervisor would have stepped in and just say, hey, you are not doing that right. A lot of people don't like, I'm saying to go back to communication. Nobody like to talk about it. They don't want to feel like they're not part of the organization because, hey, man, you're just doing it on its own. We need to bring these things back. I'm saying the training, it falls on the training. Everything rises and falls on leadership. Everything. I'm saying my job is easy for me because I'm still a, I'm a patrolman in the Baton Rouge. I still ride the streets. I'm in a marked patrol car. I'm seeing a full uniform, vest and everything. But I'm out there in the community every day seeing what the community is talking about. We don't do that. We don't do that anymore. It doesn't cost no more money, no extra time. Therefore, a basic officer just get out, walk the community, get to know what's going on inside the community. Because if we don't bring that trust back, if we don't rebuild that trust, we're going to be having incidents, too many, too many incidents. Well, we got to focus on training. The federal government got to assist us in recruiting better officers for our local. I tell people all the time, before it becomes federal, it starts local. It's a local it's, it's a local problem before we go to the federal level. And so we got to better equip our leaders. And that was so important about the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executive because we have these talks. We try to build leaders. That's our main goal, to build a professional leader from the lowest ranking member of this organization to the highest ranking. We got to sit down. So we got to, nobody likes to mentor no more. Mentoring, I don't know what happened to mentoring. It's basic stuff we can use, don't cost any money. Just the basis, just mentoring, communication, talking, getting involved in the community, walk your community. Don't wait till an incident occur to start addressing it. Don't wait till the incident happen. So until we start focusing on that, until we start focusing on that, we could continue to have so many things be going on. But this open talk today, I feel good about being on this panel today. I really do because now I feel we're reaching a broader base now. And if people could take this information back to their constituents, to the different communities throughout the nation. And let's get these things together. Let's talk about it because the 14th Amendment, it was written for a good reason. But you know, for a hundred years, Chief, we had a problem for them, them hundred years. We had a big problem for a hundred years. And still, you know, 200 years later, you know, we still having these same talks, which we shouldn't be talking about. If the leaders would have did what the constitution advised them to do. This would never, we'd never be having this conversation today because we'd be living in harmony. We'd be living in harmony right now. And I tell people all the time, that's a simple nursery rhyme I learned back when I was in elementary school. The more that we get together, the better we'll be. That's a true statement. I mean, that's, I learned that in elementary school over 40 years ago. Because your friend is my friend and my friend is your friend. So until we start getting together to work the things out, we have the same conversation 
next February talking about the same thing. So I'll end on that, Chief. Yeah, I'd like to ask a real quick follow up. You mentioned Noble and you're the president of uh, that important organization. And uh, I imagine there's some people in our country that, that don't know anything about Noble and some maybe on this call. Um, the same kind of question as Noble president, as an organization Noble, how, how does Noble help ensure equal protections for all people? To ensure equity in the administration of justice in the provision of public service to all communities and to serve as the conscience of law enforcement by being committed to justice by action. Noble is committed to justice by action to serve all communities. All communities, we put leaderships in place. We got 44 chapters throughout the nation. And we try to build things. We try to uh, somehow purpose to uh, conduct research and development average of law enforcement to establish linkage, linkage and liaison with organizations of similar concerns. So we need to give it other organizations, not just Noble, to establish effective means and strategies for dealing with racism in the field of the criminal justice, to develop mechanisms that will facilitate the change of information among black police officers and executives, and just build that camaraderie that somebody can have somebody to talk to. And our membership is growing. We don't have all the answers, but we're trying to get them. I'm saying that's why we set. We go to uh, Congress every year. We was part of the George Farm Reform Act that didn't pass. So then the talks we need to be having and our membership is increasing because more people want to get involved. So Chief, if you could help us out in that field, we appreciate it and membership is open. And I'd really like to see you come down to our Baton Rouge for our CEO symposium, which will be in March of this year. So if you're interested in coming, we'd love to have you down, sir. Well, I definitely have to think about it. I've been a long standing member of uh, the, your great organization. So we would love to see you there, sir. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Outlaw, I'd like to uh, throw it back to you real quick. How, how do you feel the department you lead, the Philadelphia Police Department, is ensuring equal protection clause in, uh, is a reality for all people in Philly? So I, I think that's, you know, there's clearly history, not just between uh, law enforcement in general and their communities, but there's history between the Philadelphia Police Department and the communities we serve. So while we've achieved a lot, I think we still have a ways to go um, with maintaining uh, trust in our community and even reestablishing some of the trust uh, that's been lost over recent years. With all of that said, um, our focus with ensuring equity isn't just outward facing. We have to make sure that we set our people up to be successful, to thrive, and to carry out the duties that we're asking them to perform, meaning we have to give them the resources that they need inward. We have to make sure, I have to make sure, as the leader of the Philadelphia Police Department, um, that I'm not only modeling the behavior, but that our department is reflecting the community that we serve. Are our policies equitable? And it, again, it's not just for people of color, but it's for all underrepresented groups within the department. What are we do in doing to ensure that there's diversity amongst the ranks? What are our processes to ensure equity and uh, diversity with how we recruit, who we promote, who we have in positions of leadership, whether they're formal or informal positions of leadership, uh, something as simple, I did this in Portland and it's in the queue for in Philadelphia, but something as simple as ensuring our uniform policy is inclusive, um, you know, for however we identify. And I, you know, I, I used to use the example all the time, you know, it's 2000, whatever the year is, it's 2022 now, but I'm still wearing a men's suit. Um, you know, what are the little things that we can do to ensure that the folks that are carrying out what we're asking them to do feel like they're being treated with dignity and respect and they're uplifted so that they can perform to the best of their abilities. And therefore we have created a culture of performance so that when we do respond to the community's call for help, unfortunately we see people in their worst of the worst most times. So if it's that one encounter when they come across a police officer, they are absolutely getting the absolute best service that they can get because we've given all the tools internally to recognize that the people internally are human beings and have the same needs of the community. And then the flip side on the outward facing piece, when we're engaging and including community, 
what are we doing to make sure and what have we done to make sure that our policies are equitable? Do we have systems of accountability in place to show the community that, you know what, we can check ourselves when we need to. We don't have to rely on a third party or an outside entity to ensure that you receive justice. What are we doing to establish goals and strategic objectives to make sure that we're not only uh, doing what we can to reduce crime, but also ensuring that on the administrative end, if there's a policy violation, it will be fairly and impartially investigated in a timely manner. And then the, the results of said investigation will be communicated to you in a timely manner. So there's so many different things uh, that we have you know, in the works, but we have to understand that sometimes this stuff takes years. And so my focus has been in the time that I've been there is to ensure that we are not only building systems of accountability, but that we are creating systems that will be in place in years to come, regardless of who sits in these seats. So it's twofold. It's not just that we're facing, but we have to invest in our people to make sure that they're carrying out their functions, um, but with the tools that they need. Thank you. Um, back to Mr. Rosenbaum. Uh, can you provide us any promising practices to help ensure the equal protection clause of the 14th Amendment for all people that you've seen or know about? Sure, and, and Commissioner Outlaw touched on a number of them in, in, in her last answer. Um, our last comprehensive settlement was with the Baltimore Police Department. Um, it covered a lot of issues, but the, the settlement begins with a requirement that the police department uh, do effective community engagement. Um, and because we think that is the fulcrum from which the rest follows. So, um, you know, a community is more than its crime statistics. It's more than its income levels. It's more than its racial demographics. Um, people living and working in that community. And I think it is incumbent on police departments and police officers to go out to the community and not just talk to them, but listen to the community and hear what, what's on their minds, what their concerns are about crime, what kind of police enforcement activity they're interested in receiving. Um, and then when uh, 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 a law enforcement strategy is, is, is developed to fit a, that kind of conversation. I think it's more likely to result in, um, in, in, a, in, a, in police activity that is respectful of, of the community. I think also, um, you know, we still live in a society that is heavily racially segregated in housing. Um, and so we should not expect that new recruits have had a lot of experience across racial lines, or, or if they have, that they have had experience being in a poorer community um, that is struggling. And so I think we need, to, we need to eliminate assumptions about everybody being good and wanting to do the right thing and help people learn what the right thing is um, through training on implicit bias, um, getting to know the community. I think those are all essential. Um, and then the next thing I'd mention is, um, you know, police collected a lot of data, um, analyze it and use it to learn whether there are racial disparities and figure out why they're, why they're there and whether, whether uh, different conduct can, can lessen those disparities. So stops, searches, arrests, uses of force are all data that police departments, particularly large police departments routinely collect, they collect it um, by race. Um, we have found um, in our work that sometimes all that data is collected, but it's not analyzed. Um, Baltimore stop data was on paper cards in shoe boxes in a closet. Um, so we analyzed it for them. And I think their lesson was it would have been better if we looked at it ourselves before the Justice Department um, came in. So, um, so I think you need to analyze your data and, and learn from it and be transparent about your data. Um, Seattle, I think in particular, also has a settlement with us. They've done a pretty good job about putting up um, information about their stop searches and arrests and analyzing the racial national origin demographics of them and, and figuring out ways to address um, the disparities um, that exist. 
Um, and so, um, so those are a range of promising practices. And at the back end, just to echo and reinforce what Commissioner Outlaw says, you've got to hold individual officers accountable and the community needs to know that you're going to do that um, and be transparent about how you do that. Thank you. Appreciate that. So uh, I want to ask each panel member this last question, and then we'll get to some of the questions. There are several questions that have come in. So um, I want to start with Commissioner Outlaw. Just final question before we get to the um, public's questions. What do you think the general public can do to ensure that we don't repeat the inequities of the 14th Amendment, uh, the inequities that it was meant to prevent? I think that's a really, really good question because we can't do our jobs. I can't do my job uh, without the community. Um, and this is no, you know, it's not an easy feat because leadership changes over the years. Uh, and again, without having um, proper systems in place. And when I say proper, I mean properly vetted systems with input from community. Um, we'll, we'll end up right back where we were and we'll continue to have these conversations and it'll be like Groundhog Day. I think um, one, being aware of our own biases. So I'm saying our as a community member now, right? Uh, being a resident of Philadelphia, being aware of what I'm bringing to the table and recognizing that I have my own biases is important. It's an, also important to be open-minded. Some of us have not had one positive interaction with law enforcement. And because of that, that may have jaded or, or introduced a bias or a, you know, brought forth an unwillingness to say, look, I'm willing to come to the table and offer solutions here, or not just finger point from an anonymous name behind a keyboard, but really say, you know what, I'm willing to sit here and have meaningful discussion about how the service you provide impacts me and how you should be doing that. There are a lot of advisory groups available in many of our departments. Um, I would say be, be vocal. If you can participate, we tend to find the same seven to 10 people in, in community meetings. And you know, with technology over the last uh, couple of years, we've all had to find creative ways to reach groups uh, and you know, outside of the traditional community meeting. So I would say be involved, you know, but also recognize when we're extending um, our hands and saying, look, we want your input. We want to include you. Um, there's nothing nefarious behind that. We need community to help us um, not only make sure that we're on point, but to ensure that we, when I, I keep talking about systems, ensuring that our policies are, are are um, up to par, ensuring that when we're teaching in our academies or in service that we have you there as an option to help co-facilitate because we need community input. We need your input in our promotional processes. We need your, you know, your input in our recruiting and our marketing processes. So again, community engagement and inclusion is so, so important that I think sometimes in law enforcement, when it's not present, we figure because we have to do this, we'll just keep on and move on because we can't find anybody. And that really shouldn't ever be the issue, but we can't find anybody to help us with this. So I, I just harp on that engagement and inclusion is key. And then lastly, I think this is really, really important. And the Congresswoman um, alluded to this as well. We can be held accountable. We need to be held accountable. We want to be held accountable but it's important to publicly support us as well when we're doing right. And that's important because like with any relationship, we're talking about a relationship here. With any relationship, if all we hear is the negative, what we don't do right, and I use the example of my, my boys, right? If I constantly get on them about how they don't load the dishwasher, right? Guess what? At some point, they're not gonna load it anymore. So because we're all human beings, we have to be able to uplift the positive to establish and maintain these relationships, but also hold our feet to the fire um, when necessary. And that's, that's when we know that we're doing our jobs properly, but we are making sure that we're maintaining our communications and that lifeline to the community when there's trust enough for somebody to say, you know what, you did that right. And they said it publicly. Thank you. Uh, Captain Thomas, same same question for you. Since we're in this together, what can the what can the general public do to ensure uh, that we don't repeat some of the same equities of the past or even the present that the Fourteenth Amendment is meant to protect us against? 
Look, I agree with Commissioner Howell Law. The community is a big part of it. I do a lot of town hall meetings throughout my community in Baton Rouge. And I always tell the community, y'all are the customers. We are customer service. We're going to provide a job, do a better job, make sure you trust us until you tell us how good we are doing. So once you get that customer service and that customer on one page, they helped out because the community is the most important piece through all of this. Through the 14th Amendment to the Civil Rights Law in 1964, the Voting Rights Act in 1965, it all starts in the community. And if we're not doing what we're supposed to do, they need to hold us accountable. So that's why it's important that the transparency come in. Uh, like we got an incident going on in Louisiana now with body worn camera that recorded an incident that two officers got arrested yesterday and the sheriff decided to release the to make an arrest on it. So the transparency coming down, the community's feeling they can trust a little bit more now. Well, if they're not helping us out, we're not doing the job. We can't hold ourselves accountable. That's the customer. Let us know what's going on. And the community is the very part to this whole America thing, the whole 14th Amendment. It's the citizens. The citizens make us right. And law enforcement officers are citizens of their communities also. So I tell guys all the time, we're doing the right thing at the right time. We shouldn't have to worry about somebody recording us on the scene because we're doing our customer service, providing help to that citizen. So we need to work together. The community needs to work with us. And that's the only way we're going to resolve this problem. To then it goes to continue, like I said earlier in my previous uh, talks. We got to work together. The community is the very important piece. We need them. Without the community, we have anything. And to make some of the community better, they just need the basic in some of the community that I serve, the black and brown community. We need the hospitals in our community. We need the good schools. We need the stores. We need banks in our community. That's, that helps a lot and build esteem in that community because they say, hey, we have our very own. Some communities we serve, some communities we serve don't have a, a decent grocery store. A decent grocery store. And that's just simple thing that we can fix to make this relationship work for law enforcement, the community, representatives, senators throughout the nation. That's how they make the thing work. Just look at the basics. Just look at the direct, direct graphics of what the 14th Amendment was for. Because we, we're not being included. That's when the problems come in. We got to be included. If you got to work on that, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rosenbaum, same question after, uh, you know, you've had a long distinguished career where it seems like almost every assignment you've had have dealt with equality. So what do you think the, uh, how, what do you feel the community at large, the general public could do to help ensure that we don't repeat some of these um, same things that the 14th Amendment is meant to protect us against? So when I talked about community engagement before, I talked about it from the lens of what the police department can do to engage the community. So I think the other half of the other part of that is I would tell people in the community not to be passive, um, to be engaged with your police department. Um, to if they're not reaching out to you, you can reach out to them. Um, and many, many at least in, in big cities in this country. Many cities have um, community citizen oversight mechanisms, sometimes appointed by the mayor, or sometimes they have different, different ways they're appointed. Um, you can get involved in the, in, in the civilian oversight mechanisms for the police department. Um, you can talk to your representatives in the city council. Um, but um, if, if you're willing to get engaged through whatever means you think is is best suited to your issue and your interests, um, you can make a difference. You don't have to sit back and wait for the police to come to you to ask for your views. Um, make them known, make them known. And I think in, in many, many, many communities in, in, in this country, um, you will find a police department that is willing to, um, to engage back with you. Thank you. So now we want to go and try to tackle as many of the audience questions as we can get to. Um, the first one, I'm, I'm actually very interested in the answer to this also. Uh, one of uh, our viewers 
uh, is at, uh, would like to ask Commissioner Outlaw, what are some of the challenges you faced as a woman uh, in a leadership position in law enforcement? Oh, wow. Where, where to begin on that one? And, and I think, you know, as I lay out some of the challenges, not all of them, but, you know, a couple of the challenges, I think it's important um, to remind folks that we are resilient and that although there's challenges faced, we can always overcome them. And that's why I'm still here. And I choose to still be here because there were many people who held the door open for me. And I feel it's my obligation to do the same. With that said, I can think of a very specific instance um, as a, uh, I, I called myself a baby police chief because you know, I'd only been in the role for maybe a year while I was a police chief in uh, Portland, Oregon. And I was at the White House with uh, some of my colleagues, about 50 other police chiefs from all over the world, not just the country, but from all over the world. And we had access to portions of the White House because we, were, we had meetings and we had a tour, so on and so forth. Um, but all of that to say, it was hot, it was super hot. And they told us that you know, we could dress down because it was so hot. And I said, my grandmother, you know, Miss Teresa is what people called her. My grandmother would roll over in her grave if I showed up at the White House in casual attire. So I'm walking in here. It might not be like Easter Sunday, but I'm, a, you know, I know better. So I had on a suit, but I threw on some white leather sneakers and a, and a T-shirt. Still appropriate, but it was still business attire. All of that to say, at one point when we accessed uh, one of the rooms in the White House, we had to go in single file. And uh, one of the personnel there, literally, I was in the middle of the single file line and uh, the, the security, I'll say security, literally stepped in front of me with the velvet rope and went clink, clink and said, are you with this group? And I couldn't believe it. I thought I misheard him at first. I said, I got all these people. I'm looking around me. I was like, me, are you talking to me? I had all these people in shorts, in tennis shoes, with collared shirts, not tucked in, and you stopped the one person in this group in, a, in, in business attire and asked me if I belonged to this group. A chief of police in a major city with chiefs of police from all over the world. And in that moment, I had to justify my existence. In that year, I mean, again, I don't remember what year it was, but you know, it was still modern times in my mind. I couldn't believe it. And it wasn't until my colleague, bless his heart to this day, turned around, white male colleague turned around. He had to vouch for me and said, yeah, she's with us. And they all blew it off. Now I'm sitting here like, okay, maybe that was a mistake. And he apologized after. But again, I kind of said, eh. shortly after that, we went to Arlington National Cemetery. We had access, we had a private tram, same thing happened. I get back to the tram and the tram conductor said to me, no ma'am, I'm sorry, your tram, is down there, way down the hill, so on and so forth. I said, what do you mean? Now I recalled the incident that had just occurred in the White House. I pointed to my water bottle that was sitting right there. And my colleague at the time saw what was going on from way up the hill. You can almost see it happen in a slow motion. And he's going, no, <laughs> because I guess my, my face was showing that somebody was about to get it, <laughs> right? I was so angry. I was so angry that in this day and age, that because of my appearance or because I appear youthful, even though I'm real old on the inside or whatever it is, because I traditionally don't fit the mold of a major city police chief or commissioner, um, that I still have to justify and explain why I belong, even though my credentials speak for myself. And I will tell you as a woman, typically as a black woman, when we get these seats, we're afforded these positions, whether intentional or unintentional, we as women typically get these positions when an organization is at its worst. We're brought in to fix, to clean up. Um, and then if things don't go right within one year, two years, or however long, see, I told you. And it's often done because we're introduced with the things that we can't change. So instead of me being introduced with my qualifications, my experience, my background, all the things that make me me, it's, and I get it, but it's, well, she's the first black woman. And so people are focusing on that, as opposed to, let me tell you why we brought her here. Oh, and she happens to be. And so we spend more of our time explaining why we should be at the table or why we deserve than we should, because we're not, they don't lead with, 
why we're competent. And I know most times it's done for, you know, with well intentions, but it does, it does more harm than good. So I will tell you now my position of leadership, I almost have to do things twice because I spend, and it's gotten better, but I found myself having to spend more time explaining the why behind something or explaining my, my, my qualifications where my colleagues, they always get the benefit of the doubt because they fit the traditional mold. So while I tell you it has not always been easy, the good news is that there are many others um, who have experienced what, have I, what I've experienced and, and now, and, and they speak up, but now that I know what I'm looking at, you know, microaggressions before we all got the training years ago, um, nobody knew what microaggressions were, but because we recognize what these obstacles are and they have a name, we know how to call them out. We know how to hold people accountable. We, and we know how to create a more inclusive uh, environment. So I will just say it's been a wild ride. There's still a lot more work to be done, but I appreciate the fact that there is a recognition that there are many more like me who have been working behind the curtain for a very long time and they just need op an opportunity uh, to be upfront. Well, thank you for sharing all that uh, often very personal stories. And I would say you have more than justified your existence and have gone where many have not gone before you. So thank you. Um, thank we're you. out of time. So I just wanted to ask one more question and then turn it back over to Thomas. And this would be for Captain Thomas. Uh, one of the uh, listeners posed this question. What are some of the best practices that we can that can be used to take this conversation to the point where it changes culture, both within the law enforcement community and also uh, the civilian communities at large. You're on mute. Thank you, Chief, for that question. Well, to the panelists, not the panelists, but the person who led the question, we started today. Today is the first day that we can start this conversation. They're going to go right back to the communication part. So we take what we got from this meeting today, the good and the bad, Let's start discussing these things. Let's, let's discuss it in roll call training with your peers. Let's discuss it with the community at town hall meeting. I go to town hall meetings probably twice a week. It starts there. I'm saying we starting it, we leading it, and that's what it works at. The leadership, not only the top leadership, but the lowest ranking leadership, the community people in the community. Let's talk to that person in that community. I have a program that I use with my patrol guys at home we know who the major players are. We know the people causing the problem. I say, why not talk to them? Let them know that, hey, we know who you are. We know who you are. We're going to be out here patrolling this community, and we want to start that relationship with you. So they start at the very basics. And the basic chief is just communication. Nobody want to talk no more. Nobody want to talk. They only want to wait till it get bad. Then once it get bad, Hey, well, we got to talk to him. We need to call. Uh, we need to call Chief Hunt in California. Or we need to call, you know, Noble. We don't need to do that, people. We can do that right now together today. So it's, it's change that dialogue. Let's start talking about it. I know some people get into their feelings, but sometimes we just got to stop that. <laughs> I'm just gonna tell the truth, Chief. I'm a person. I'm straight to the point. I learned that from the military. You got to go straight to the point. And remember, the mission is always first. The mission is always first. We are here to protect and serve at the law enforcement part of it, and the community protects and serves us. We got to work together. We have to work together. It's just a dialogue. We need to talk every day, call somebody. You know, we got to bring that basic stuff back. Because what we're doing right now throughout the country is not working. It's not working. We all know right from wrong. We all know right from wrong, from the citizen to the law enforcement officer. Until we start having the real, real good conversations. And let's take the race out of it. You don't have anything to do with race. It's just a society. That's what we're dealing with now, the society. And it dictates, I'm just saying like the Congressman Shea over there now, I'm trying to, with the war that's going on, I'm taking that pretty serious now because I was in the military for 26 years and I know how, and I know how the people feel about their democracy being violated today. But we got to have these talk. And we've got a long way to go, but it's getting better. Dialogue's getting better. People are communicating more now. 
and that's where we're gonna start. So to, today, let's all agree that, hey, we're gonna start talking. Thank you. Thank you for your time, sir. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. And I, I'd just like to say thank you to the panel members. I know you're very, very busy people. I appreciate you taking out the time and for all the people that joined on today. Uh, like I said earlier, it takes us all together. The vision has never worked. And these are some of the beginnings of uh, understanding and how we can move forward. And with that, I'd like to turn it uh, back over to Thomas. Thank you, Chief Han, for your thoughts this evening, um, as well for your presentation earlier in the program. We really appreciate you putting that together and delivering that for us today. Thank you also to Commissioner Outlaw, Captain Thomas, Stephen Rosenbaum, Tony Heredia, Assistant Attorney General Clark, and of course, Congresswoman Jackson Lee for all of your perspectives and insights. This was an amazing group of people and we are so glad that we were able to bring you all together today. And of course, we wanna thank Target for sponsoring tonight's program and for your ongoing support of important conversations in our communities. The National Law Enforcement Museum is committed to telling the stories of American law enforcement. This month and always, the idea of equal protection under the law is an essential part of that story. And we're glad to have brought this conversation again to you this evening. Be sure to look for even more museum programs like this on our website at lawenforcementmuseum.org and on our various social media channels. On your next visit to Washington, DC, come visit the museum and experience the vibrant story of American law enforcement in person. And we're also excited to share that all law enforcement officers receive free general admission every Saturday at the museum. Thank you again for joining us today. Farewell, and thank you to all of the law enforcement officers out there. Be safe.